All right. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here. So my name is Travis Sher. I'm co-founder, managing partner of a crypto-focused investment firm based out of New York called North Island Ventures, live here from New York right now. Excited to be talking to Sergey, who is the founder and CEO of an interoperability project called Axelar. Um, so uh, Axelar got started back in 2020. Uh, North Island Ventures invested initially back then. Um, so, Sergey, my, my first question for you. As I mentioned, you got started back in 2020. At the time, there were really only a few blockchains in the world that had any meaningful adoption at all, uh, primarily Bitcoin and Ethereum. So um, the big idea behind Axelar, and we'll get much more into it, is that it connects layer one blockchains. Um, but what gave you sort of the, the conviction to start Axlar then? Why did you think there was a need for something like it? Maybe tell us a little bit more about your backstory. Um, and, uh, and yeah, explain kind of how you saw the future then. Yeah, no, for sure. Great to be here. And uh, yeah, great question, uh, Travis. So, um, you know, my background kind of very quickly is in distributed systems and cryptography, right? So I worked on you know, systems that, you know, are, uh, like in, in the networking stack that's supposed to give you like microsecond, you know, responses when you query them, right? In the blockchain space, we're talking about like minutes, right? Or, you know, 15 minute finality, which is sort of a luxury, right? But um, sort of before Axler, my co-founder and I, we were building the Algorithm protocol, right? And we really try to solve the scalability issue, right? Uh, around uh, kind of EVM stacks or Ethereum. But as we were doing it, it was very clear that, there's still a lot of room and a lot of innovation that has to happen for layer ones to continue to scale. But no matter what, for the ecosystem to keep on growing, we're gonna need to have many different layer ones and many different layer twos, or layer threes, or whatever you call them, just to observe the demand from the applications, right? In kind of web two world, we're not running everything on a single database. We're not running everything on a single network. We isolate resources across multiple databases, across multiple networks, and that's what gives us a very good user experience, right? And developer experience that can give us instant, you know, instant delivery of packets like across the world, like we have today. And so to do that in Web3, we're going to need to isolate applications somehow, right? Across different layers, across different, you know, resources. And that means more chains, more layers, more fragmentation. And in that world, how do you connect everything together and still keep a unified developer experience is going to be a fundamental problem to solve. And so that's what led us to Accelerate Server. I bet that the ecosystem is going to continue growing, but for it to grow, it still needs to be unified together, right? And so that's what we're trying to do with Axler. Awesome. So, um, so back in 2020, you sort of foresaw that, you know, we were going to enter this multi-chain world, I think, before it had materialized. Um, you weren't the only one to see it. There were actually uh, a couple first generation interop projects. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when I describe Axelar to people who are somewhat familiar with the crypto blockchain space, but not deeply familiar, they say, oh, it, it's like uh, Cosmos or Polkadot. Um, but it's not exactly. So maybe you could just start by distinguishing Axelar from those sort of first generation projects that got started, you know, several years prior. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, Polka, uh, Dot, and Cosmos, like, they have started with a question, you know, of uh, designing an ecosystem that has many chains that's interoperable with each other, right? So kind of in Cosmos world, you can launch a chain, that chain can talk with other Cosmos chains. Same thing in Polka Dot world, you can launch a chain using a specific software stack, you know, and that chain will talk to other, you know, chains uh, uh, within itself. But that's not sufficient. Kind of how do you really go across ecosystems that speak very different languages, that have very different properties, that can innovate really from the bottom up, everything from the consensus to smart contracts to wallet interactions, and still have connectivity? And that means having a protocol 
in a system that can sort of be as a plug and play component, right? That does not impose any restrictions on the consensus, does not impose any restrictions on the software or virtual machine that you can use so that all these layer ones and layer twos can continue innovating, continue advancing. But once they need connectivity, they can just employ a plug and play solution, you know, like Axler and instantly get connectivity to dozens or hundreds of other ecosystems, right? And so that's really the difference is that Polkadot and, you know, and Cosmos were designed with interoperability within their own networks, you can think of it that way, but very different networks that have different languages, different properties needed other types of protocols, right? And so that's what we have done with Axler. Our job has been to allow innovation to happen at any layer of the stack while still preserving connectivity or allowing all these layers to have connectivity with um, with other ecosystems. So you can think of it as a, you know, Polkadot out of Cosmos, but for everybody. Got it. So, um, yeah, so Polkadot and Cosmos each kind of built these own, their own ecosystems that are networks of networks, but they're not fully interoperable with, you know, the broader ecosystems of blockchains. And what Axelar brought to bear was the ability to connect any blockchain, um, no matter you know, what sort of programming language it uses or, or you know, what sort of virtual machine it uses. Um, another misconception that I often get, um, again, from people who are, you know, familiar with crypto, but not necessarily super deep and, and certainly not super deep on Axelar, is that Axelar is like a bridge. Um, uh, but it's not, it's more, right? So can you, can you kind of explain, you know, what Axelar is vis-a-vis -vis the concept of a bridge? Yeah, so I think whenever people refer to a bridge, right? So what are they really referring to? They refer to sort of a pairwise object that connects A and B that transfers tokens, right? From one chain to another, and it's mostly a centralized, you know, solution, right? Um, so that's what people used to. And kind of these bridges were actually built, uh, you know, during the last few years as really ad hoc solutions to solve interoperability for the specific use case, transfer tokens from one chain to another, right? But because they're, you know, was shipped very rapidly because they're very ad hoc solutions, because many of them are really centralized, they run like a few nodes or a multi-sig, um, so they're vulnerable to attacks, right? And that's what we have seen over the last, you know, few years, lots of money has been lost in these centralized <laughs> solutions for the purpose of token transfer. And so, you know, at Axelot, what we're trying to do is much beyond that, and we think about well, how do applications from one ecosystem talk to another ecosystem to enable user interactions between them in a seamless and efficient way, right? And that means actually not having to have users move tokens back and forth, right? If you have a token on one chain, but you see an application on another chain, you should be able to invoke it with one click and the application should be able to just to kind of talk to one another across these chains. Maybe that communication could involve token transfer, but it doesn't have to involve a token transfer. It could simply be a contract call that's made from one smart contract on one chain to another smart contract to another chain, right? And so this is what really we're doing with Axler. It's kind of a general composability layer, right? That you can use to compose your applications across chains in the same way as you can compose them if they were all built like on Ethereum. Right, where you have full composability with smart contracts, but now that's extended across ecosystems. And so your composability could involve token transfers, it could, but it could involve arbitrary, you know, NFT transfers, contract calls, you know, borrowing and lending types of requests, swaps, or anything else you can you can really think of it. Um, so that's one thing. That's kind of on the functionality side. Um, the second big piece that sort of differentiates Axler is actually its security. Right. So Axler is a <laughs> blockchain that's based on proof of stake layer that's been designed to connect other blockchains. So at the very core of it is a security property um, that is similar to the security properties of other layer ones that we connect, right? There is an open and decentralized validator set. It's open participation. It's censorship free transactions that anybody can submit without getting um, you know, their requests filtered. So security kind of comes at the very core of Axelor. Um, and yeah, and kind of a finally, we always think about kind of how do we build sort of these seamless developer and user experiences. And that comes with a various services around the network that actually can enable us to facilitate the types of interactions, uh, you know, that, that I talk about it. So it's a kind of a full stack of interoperability as opposed to kind of a, a single solution like token transfers that 
kind of traditional bridges have been designed around. Got it. So um, I think that earlier when you were, you know, referencing moving beyond, you know, token transfers, what you were talking about is sort of moving from uh, transferring tokens to passing messages across chain, right? So um, why don't you talk about, sure. you know, Axelar's ability to enable general message passage, general message passing, um, where that stands and why it's so important. Yeah, so general message passing, I would say, is a kind of a, the new paradigm, right, of interoperability, where you can really perform an arbitrary cross-chain contract calls that can involve very complicated functions, right? So let, let me give you an example, right? So one common function that users do is that if they have a token on one chain, they want to be able to swap it to a token on another chain. How, do, how did they do it before, right? And kind of accelerate in some of the solutions. They, they take a token, they maybe wrap it, they find some bridge front end, they move it through the bridge front end. Then, oh, they figure out, oh, I need to get some gas to pay on the destination chain, right? They, they figure out some gas, maybe a centralized exchange, swap their wallet, find some swap service, go and swap their wrap token, right? So it's like 10 steps in the process just to do one action, swap token A for a token B, right? So now all of these things are, very much automatable, right? And so you can actually automate them in what we call as a message, right? And you can encode that message with the user's transaction and say the user wants to swap A for B, like this is exactly from which chain to which other chain they wanna do this, and this is where they wanna receive it. And you can send that message through Axler and the user's request will get executed on one chain, on another chain, and finally, you know, maybe multiple swaps will take process and they get their wallets at the destination, right? So you can encode kind of a program, right, in the message to automate a lot of user actions and remove their friction and painful experiences for, you know, interacting with all of these blockchains. So this is the concept of general message passing. It enables a lot more than that. You can compose liquidity because you have contracts that can talk to one another. You can compose DEXs, right? So um, across unified liquidity, you can do cross-chain loans. So you can really unify liquidity and enable simple user interactions. That's really the goal of this, right? Um, and so that's what we're doing uh, with, with general message passing. And kind of the final point that I'll mention, you know, on top of it is that it actually enables you to deliver much more secure cross-chain applications than with like token bridges, right? And the reason for this is that the user actions can be encoded in such a way <clears throat> that they always end up with, let's say like native tokens on the source and destination chain and never hold like wrapped assets, right? Uh, and, um, and so in that game, you know, you can, you can only take, uh, you only take a very ephemeral risk on the bridging, like maybe during the duration of your transfer, but there is no like big honeypots of, you know, like thousands or hundreds of millions of dollars um, that the attacker could compromise. Users always end up with their native tokens, right? And, uh, you know, they continue interacting with the chains and with the applications in a completely native way once their cross-chain requests are completed. So the general message passing is sort of a new paradigm which will enable much safer, right, more unified and, uh, you know, simple interaction across multiple chains. Awesome. And uh, and where is Axelar on its roadmap as it relates to GMP? Yeah, so it's actually fully ruled out across all of the chains that we support, right? We support over 38 chains through the stack, everything from, you know, Ethereum, layer ones, layer twos, uh, kind of Polkadot, a lot of Cosmos chains, uh, kind of Osmosis, right, Samalier, uh, Cosmos Hub, and the list goes on and goes on. And so we originally rolled out general message passing between EVM chains only. And uh, over the last month, we actually announced that we rolled it out between Cosmos and all the EVM chains, right? And so what that really enabled is that any Cosmos chains can be fully interoperable with any EVM chain completely, right? And I think that's, that's really, really exciting. So what that means is that you can build, you know, your app chain, fully customize your consensus from the ground up, right? Anything you like from it. You can interact within Cosmos through IBC, but every time you want to go outside of Cosmos, you know, you can rely on Axel and general message passing to enable uh, your application to be accessible from uh, different EVM chains. And so the types of experiences that you can imagine is that you can have, you know, a MetaMask user interacting from Ethereum with a Cosmos app chain without even realizing it. Right, so for instance, like DYDX is gonna be a Cosmos app chain. You would literally be able to interact with it from your EVM wallet or um, you know, any EVM chain 
without even thinking about it uh, if everything is programmed using GMP. So I think that's you know completely mind boggling. Awesome. Um, so uh, so we've already distinguished Axelar from the first generation interop projects and from uh, bridges. Um, there's other kind of next gen uh, interop projects out there, some of whom I think are also speaking at this event. So how do you distinguish Axelar from the others? How do you think about sort of the different approaches that, that people have? Um, and uh, yeah, why is Axelar the best? Yeah, no, two points of it. I think the first one is security, right? Uh, and Axel is the only cross-chain interoperability protocol across dozens of ecosystems that's fully decentralized and based on proof of stake security, right? So I think a lot of the protocols that are in the market today, they rely on like centralization. So they have, you know, fixed number of entities that are responsible for doing all the cross-chain functions. And that adds a huge risk as we have seen, you know, over the years, kind of these things get compromised sooner or later. Um, so it is kind of a security at its core. The second piece is that is the functionality, right? So Axelar, like I said earlier, is a programmable blockchain, right? And so what that means is that you can actually design your own interoperability connectors to it, right? You can build your own interoperability functions at the Axelar core networking layer. And so what we have done is really brought programmability to the interoperability from the bottom up, everything from general message passing to the actual programmability of the interoperability stack, right? Um, and so you can really build much more interesting use cases with that. You know, you can build uh, everything from routing protocols to connectivity to Axelar, kind of cross-chain naming services in a very, very efficient way. So, and that's what really sets it apart, right? Where a lot of the other um, approach is a pure kind of a message passing layers, right, through the SDKs or, um, you know, their protocols, but Axel is a programmable blockchain with its own ecosystem and with its own, you know, kind of an open source community around it. Um, so, yeah, I would say those are two that the core things. Awesome. Um, we've talked a lot about the tech. So, um, Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the use cases. So what are some of the companies building on Axelar today? Yeah, I mean, I'll give a couple of examples. So one, like I mentioned earlier, sort of a cross-chain swaps, right? So very simple use case, but I think it's fundamental to do it correctly, given that we have seen failure of, you know, a lot of centralized exchanges as an example, right? So why are centralized exchanges exist there? Because they allowed users to swap A for B in very simple interfaces, right? And they did it in a centralized way, you know, and some, some of them do it a good job, but many of them are kind of a failing at doing it. And so kind of decentralized cross-chain swaps, I think is a fundamental primitive, right? And a building block that we need for the ecosystem. And so you have protocols like a squid router that are building this on top of Axelar, you know, using the general message passing framework. Um, then you have protocols like, um, you know, Prime Protocol that is doing cross-chain borrowing and lending use cases, right? So I have a token on one chain. I want to take a loan in a token on another chain. I want to do everything with one click. Like I want to do it with the best liquidity properties I can have. And so having the Axelar stack in the connected gives you both, you know, the best liquidity properties, but simple UXs. Um, then you have, you know, NFT applications. We have a bunch of those kind of building a, you know, cross-chain NFTs. We have applications like, you know, um, Samalier that is building their uh, vaults across uh, different EVM chains using using the Axelar stack and, you know, really composing these, um, you know, Cosmos and uh, EVM ecosystems. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of use cases, I would say, Pretty much every application that you have seen throughout the last bull cycle that makes sense in crypto, right? That that kind of has some type of a product market fit can benefit from being cross-chain, right? For both user experience and liquidity. And that's what we're seeing right now, uh, you know, um, kind of a, the, the rewriting of a lot of those uh, applications that have a product market fit to be completely chain agnostic. Cool. Um... What are some of the big multi-chain cross-chain ideas um, that you'd like to see built on Axelar um, in the near term? And what are some that you sort of imagine are possible over the longer term? Yeah, no, great question. So I think we are starting to enter the space in the in the blockchain ecosystem where different chains or different layers are starting to specialize more and more, right? So as an example, 
you know, we've had Filecoin for a while, right? And Filecoin kind of gives you, you know, the cheapest uh, storage, right, that you can access. But then at the same time, on Ethereum, storage is expensive, right? You know, every time you want to store, you know, a key or a piece of data, it's very, very expensive. So I'm looking forward to kind of exploring this design space of where you can combine chains with different properties to offer the best, you know, user experience and the best, you know, economic and uh, technical efficiency, right? I store file on chain X, I have a DeFi primitive that uses metadata about the file, you know, on chain Y, and I do it in a very uh, seamless way for the users that they don't have to actually even think that they interact in across multiple chains, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say like the next uh, kind of year or two, I think that's will be really, really interesting is to expose. And I think some of the year I, I mentioned earlier is, is playing a, along this, um, this innovative frontier, right, where they have their own chain that has very specific purposes, that have very specific privacy properties, right, and, uh, you know, security properties, and they want to expose that and connect that with other EVM chains, right? So, like, uh, because some of those things that you could do on the Sumlier chain, you could not do natively in smart contracts on other chain. So, you really need your own valid data set, you, you really need your own consensus for those properties, right? But you can still compose it with smart contracts um, on other chains. So yeah, like to me, that's the, you know, that's the next exciting part. I mean, you know, everybody talks about, of course, like AI now getting into crypto more and more. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see. I think I, I just had a call like earlier today about like leveraging AI to, um, you know, kind of a predict uh, some information on chain about smart contracts and, uh, you know, um, some liquidity movements around them. So I think it'll be definitely in the kind of a, medium to long-term, uh, you know, design space to, to explore how does AI uh, get merged with crypto. Yeah. Um, so the examples you just provided um, are, are very relevant to my next question. I'll ask it anyway. Um, I, I think one of the ideas people have is that, you know, interoperability is really just all about horizontal scaling, right? It's, and it's kind of, you know, one of your initial ideas around why we needed a multi-chain world, right? Was, um, you know, we need to we need to uh, basically make it more seamless for users to access more block space, right? Um, and so, you know, they think of interop networks as as you know just another scaling solution, but it's it's more than that, right? Um, so uh, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that um but how do you think about it in terms of you know beyond scaling yeah no i mean beyond scaling uh interoperability allows innovation to happen at free will i would say right I, and i think to me kind of as we've been designing actually it's been one of the core properties right um because like i said you know you have Cosmos, right? And you have interoperability within it, right? And you know, uh, so why didn't we? Why didn't we do everything within Cosmos, right? Why didn't? Why isn't everybody running on the kind of a Cosmos SDK? Because you know, we still need to innovate across the stacks. We still need to allow um, different shapes and forms of these blockchains to to happen, right? Everything from zero knowledge chains to different languages, like people experimenting, right? Uh, kind of a Rust, you know, Solidity move languages and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so, you know, besides everything that, that, that I've said kind of earlier today, um, you know, to me and like everything we've been doing at Axel is to kind of preserve the right and the property of allowing the innovation to happen. Because I think we're still at the infrastructure layer. There's still a lot of work to be done to really come up with a stack and, you know, and come up with a way that people will interact with all of these layers and technologies. And, um, you know, we, we need to allow that to happen more frictionlessly. Awesome. Um, so uh, earlier today, you brought to my attention that in the last 24 hours, there have been, you know, four separate security issues with bridges. And you've mentioned security as, you know, a really important feature of Axelar a few times. Obviously, there have been uh, numerous hacks of bridges over the last couple of years. Most of the biggest hacks in crypto have been of bridges, sometimes for extraordinary amounts of money. Um, yeah, so, so maybe just, uh, kind of cover what are the key characteristics that I, of Axelar that allow you to sleep at night? Yeah. So I would say, you know, security is a multi-dimensional problem, 
and you have to solve it with kind of you have to solve it full stack as well. Right? So the way we approach it at Axler, a you have to start with the right design, right? So like I said earlier, Axler is the only interoperability solution that's fully decentralized based on proof of stake security that gives you interoperability across different chains, right? So starting with a decentralized design that's um, that's very very important because it allows diversity of participants. It allows kind of the best people and the best technical teams and the validators to, you know, get more voting power in the consensus. It allows diversification of software deployments. So decentralization is really, really critical for practical purposes of security, right, of the systems. So that's that, that's the bottom layer, kind of starting with the right design, right? On top of it, you know, every time you build in um, kind of a, a system, a secure system, you have to think about uh, robust engineering practices, right? So everything from kind of doing audits, we've done, you know, uh, dozens of audits, like over 40 at this point, to having multi-million dollar bug bounties, right? That people can go and participate in, running rigorous unit tests, end-to-end -end tests, you know, uh, so really robust engineering, right? And kind of a bringing the best practices that, um, you know, secure serve the web two or traditional stacks to web three, I think is very important. And the final property that I mentioned is sort of what we call is like application layer add-ons for security, right? So if you're building a bridging application, even if you're moving tokens, you know, on top of Axler, then you should think about maybe having things like rate limits, right? So there is no need for, uh, you know, withdrawal of all of your funds that, that you know, from, from a single smart contract that can happen within five minutes, right? So you can pretty reasonably estimate uh, how much liquidity needs to go in and out. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, you can design your application with, with rate limits. And so, you know, a lot of the applications that are building on top of Axel, we're kind of encouraging and suggesting these safe practices. So that's the third layer, right? So it's the right design, engineering practices, application layer add-ons. And the final point I'll just mention is what I said earlier, is that general message passing paradigm really gives you a new design space that you can play with to build inherently more secure, decentralized or interchain native applications that take very minimal security risk from the underlying bridges, okay? So, you know, I encourage people to check out things like, you know, Squid Protocol is very, very interesting in creative design where you can effectively do like a cross-chain atomic swap of your token. You'll always end up with a native token. You take very minimal risk, you know, from the underlying bridge provider. Um, and, you know, I can keep on going on, on that list, but this is this is what I would encourage everybody to, to explore is like real leveraging, general composability across chains and you can actually come up with a very secure design that that takes very little assumptions from the underlying risk. Awesome. Um, I'll end with one question. Um, it's a little bit um, philosophical, right? So I think one of the things that makes Axelar uh, so amazing is that um, it really is uh, making the ecosystem fundamentally more decentralized, in my opinion, right? It's taking us out of this world of these sort of tribal uh, branded blockchains. It's allowing users to have the autonomy, not only to control their own crypto, but to move it wherever they want. And it's allowing developers, you know, to engage with multiple chains at once and build kind of whatever they want. So they're not tied to one ecosystem. Um, so why, uh, why is decentralization important to you? And how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, to me, decentralization is important because it allows innovation to happen at very different prop with very different properties than it could happen otherwise in traditional systems, right? So, whenever you run a decentralized network or an application, uh, it should be fully composable. It should be fully uh, frictionless for the people to get in and out of it, right? Uh, it allows you. Um, yeah, to kind of interoperate with other ecosystems that have made very different views, right? But maybe you don't agree, or maybe you do agree with, with right? And you get to decide when you want to go in and out of those kind of ecosystems. But um, to make sure that those properties are preserved, making sure that the underlying technology is decentralized is, is fundamental so that these rights cannot be just cut overnight. Right, um, and so to me, that's that's why decentralization is important. Right, it's uh, it's really allowing people to you know express themselves, collaborate whenever they choose to, or not collaborate whenever they choose to. Awesome, great answer. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, SCB. Um, and uh, yeah, really, it's been a pleasure. So you should all check out Axelar follow along. It is, uh, in my opinion, uh, probably the most fascinating infrastructure project in the space. Um, doesn't get 
uh, as much attention um, uh, as it should, um, but uh, it's really amazing. So thank you so much, Sergey. Thanks, Travis. It was great chatting as always.